when people have time for only one meditation session a day, I usually recommend that they aim for the morning, right after they get up. The mind is refreshed, the body's refreshed. You haven't started picking up the narrative threads of the day, so it's a good time to get the mind in good shape. But of course, it's not the only time you want to get the mind in good shape. And when you have time for more meditation sessions, you can meditate any time at all. In fact, the true answer to the question is, when's the best time to meditate? The answer is always, right now. But meditating at different times of the day presents different challenges. If you're meditating at the end of the day, like we are right now, there may be a lot left over. The body may be tired, the mind may be frazzled from the events of the day. And so you've got to sweep things out a bit. In terms of the body, try to breathe in a way that feels really refreshing. Now think of it sweeping through the body, cleaning out all the cobwebs, all the little knots of tension that may have built up during the day. And as for the mind, sweep that out too. Whatever the narratives of the day, no matter how horrible the day was, you can make a new narrative, saying, even though I was abused in these ways and I was mistreated in these ways, I was able to rise above it. I had a really good meditation. I didn't let those events scar the mind. And you'll find that part of the mind resists that. There's a certain satisfaction that comes in going over the narrative of the day. Even if it's been a bad narrative, it's like picking at a scab on a wound. But you just want to keep reminding yourself there is a better alternative. Several years back I was teaching a group of people and on the topic of the Brahma Viharas, and we came across the, the passages where the Buddha is talking to two women who've lost their children. In a way to help them get over their grief. And someone in the group complained. They said, Is the Buddha saying you shouldn't let the women grieve after all? Don't they have a right to grieve? And of course they have the right to grieve. And the Buddha is telling them how to get over the grief. He's not telling them they have to do it. He's telling them they can. And he's showing ways of thinking that help. And one of the ways of thinking that's good is to. Think about the whole world, all the beings in the world, and as in the Buddha's second knowledge on the night of his awakening, all the beings are rising and passing away. And not just arising and passing away like bubbles on a stream, I mean actually dying and being reborn and then dying again. And seeing all those dramas, but seeing the dramas played out against such an enormous canvas enabled him to get away from the details and to look at the, the larger pattern, which is that we live and we die and we're born in terms of our karma. Prior to that, he'd had the first knowledge where he'd seen his own lifetimes, and it all seemed pretty random, up and down. Sometimes he would do something good in this lifetime and have a horrible next lifetime. Sometimes he'd do something really bad in this lifetime, and the next time lifetime would be okay. But as he stepped back and saw the larger pattern, he was able to see, okay, karma really is what shapes things. Sometimes it takes a long, long time for an action to show its fruits. And then seeing the larger picture like that, then he realized, okay, where does the karma come from? It comes from the mind. So he turned and looked at the mind. And all the ups and downs of the world come from here, the ups and downs in the mind. If you don't turn into the mind, there's no end of the story. But it's by turning into dealing with the issues in your own mind. That's how the story ends. Otherwise, it just goes back and forth and back and forth. That's a story that's told in the commentary about two women, a major wife and a minor wife. And the major wife didn't have any sons, but the minor wife had a son. And the major wife was afraid that this would mean the end of her position as major wife. So she killed the son of the minor wife. And then in lifetimes that followed, the 
minor wife was born as an animal of one kind, and the major wife as another animal of another kind, and the minor wife killed the son of the, the major wife, and it went back and forth until you forgot who was the major wife and who was the minor wife. And it didn't end until this lifetime, the time of the Buddha. One woman wanted to kill the child of another, the other one, so the other one went running in into the monastery. So both of them, both of them, there were right in front of the Buddha, and he said, "Look, this has been going on for so long that to the point you can't remember who started it. Do you want to keep it going, or do you want it to end?" And so we want it to end. And so you have to develop the right qualities of mind. That's how things end. So when you think in these ways, it's sweeping out the mind, sweeping out the body, and you're ready to settle down. And if any other issues keep coming up, you just think about thoughts of goodwill, thoughts of forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you, as I say, forgive and forget or try to love the other person. It's simply that you're not going to pose any danger to the other person, and in doing that you're protecting yourself. Because if you're trying to pose dangers to other people, you're posing a danger to yourself, too. So you learn to look at things in the larger canvas and keep that canvas at hand in case you have trouble settling down. And then you've got the breath. Do what you can to make the breath as interesting and as comfortable and as enjoyable as possible. Because here at the end of the day, you need energy. So ask yourself what kind of breathing would feel energizing right now. And sometimes the body will respond immediately, so let it do its thing. Other times it just doesn't respond much, it just keeps on breathing in the same old way. And this is when you can consciously adjust the breath. until you find a way of breathing that's engaging. And you can also think about the breath energy going into parts of the body that it rarely goes to, or going in directions that you ordinarily don't think about. If your back is feeling tired from the day, think of the breath energy coming from the soles of the feet up the legs and going up the back. Think of a sense of strength and solidity at the back. If there's a pain in the back and you find that focusing in the back makes it worse, then focus on the front of the body. The important thing is that if there are pains in the body, don't let them get you down. Because the pains in the body that come when you're meditating are nothing compared to the pains that can come as you get older and as you get sick and as you approach death. You want to remember that you want your mind to be solid and unshaken especially at times like that. So if it's shaking around right now, you've got work to do. In the Buddha's analysis of feelings, his steps of breath meditation, he starts out by saying you try to develop a way to breathe so you give rise to rapture. So ask yourself what kind of breathing right now would allow the body to feel really full of breath energy inside. And then you breathe in a way that gives rise to pleasure, which sometimes means if the rapture gets too intense and it's no longer pleasant, try to breathe in a way that's more subtle. And then he simply says, breathe in and out sensitive to metal fabrication and breathe in and out calming metal fabrication. Now those two steps require a lot of teasing out. Metal fabrication is perception and feeling. And you want to see how they're having, those two things together have an impact on the mind. If there's a pain in the body, it's having an impact on the mind, not only because of the pain, but even more importantly, the perception. This is where John Mahabha's instructions on dealing with pain fit really neatly into what the Buddha had to say. You start asking questions about the perceptions. 
how do you perceive the pain? Do you see the pain as identical with the part of the body it's in? Can you perceive in a way that it's something different? As he points out, the body is just the four elements, earth, water, wind, and fire, or solidity, energy, coolness, warmth. But the pain is something else. It's a mental phenomenon. It's not physical. But your awareness, which is also mental, is something different. The awareness knows the pain. The pain doesn't know your awareness. So you've got three things there that are very different. They're all in the same spot, but they're different. They're not the same thing. And so if you can detect the differences among them, that helps to separate your awareness from the pain or separate the body from the pain. And that way, the pain is a lot easier to deal with. Even though the pain may not go away, the bridge that connects is not there. In other words, you've learned how to sense how a perception is, influ <clears throat> is causing the pain to have an influence on the mind, and then you change the perception so that it doesn't. See, so if you can give rise to a sense of pleasure in the parts of the body, do that. In fact, when you're going to deal with the pain, you don't want to jump right in. It's first good to have a good, solid sense of some spot in the body that's yours, that's your safe spot. And it may be a part of the body that you tend to ignore because it's just okay, nothing special. Pain is what is a magnet that draws your attention. But you can start thinking about the space around the pain, this part, <clears throat> the parts of the body that are comfortable. Focus there. Settle in there. In a John Lee's analogy, he says it's like eating a mango. There may be a wormy spot in the mango. Well, you don't eat the wormy spot. You cut that out and you eat the rest. It's like lying down on the fl floor of your house. If the floorboards in one spot are deteriorating, you don't lie down there. You lie down in the spot where the floorboards are good. Make the sense of ease and comfort your home base here in the body. And then when you feel secure there, then you can start looking to the pain and start asking the right questions. And the, que the right question is not how to make the pain go away. The right question is how to understand why this pain is having an impact on the mind. Because that impact on the mind, that's the suffering and the Four Noble Truths. The physical pain itself is not the suffering and the Four Noble Truths. It's the clinging. And how do we cling? We tend to cling through perceptions. Work on your perceptions around the pain. Be curious about the pain. And then you can transfer that same set of questions into events going on in the mind. If the mind's been in a bad mood, learn how to be curious about the bad mood. How does this bad mood come in? What does it do to keep itself there? What are its tentacles? What are its Velcro strips? Can I peel them off? To what extent am I buying into some pretty bad reasons for allowing the mood to stay? And of course, part of the mind will say, I have the right to have a bad mood. But you have at least part of the mind, another part of the mind that says, okay, I don't have to be here. There's a way out. And in being curious about the mood, you pull yourself away from it. So at the end of the day, as the body's getting worn down from the day or the mind's getting worn down from the day, you'll often find that being curious about the state of being worn down gives you energy. It allows you to step back from it and realize there are resources in the mind and in the body that haven't been exhausted by the day. And you can tap into them. As the Buddha said, when you encounter pain in terms of what you've seen or heard or smelled or tasted or touched or thought about in the course of the day, 
The right response is not trying to get pleasant sights, sounds, smells, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations. The, ple the proper response is to remind yourself, here I am being overcome by these things. I want out. And that thought may be painful, but it's the pain that gets you into the practice and allows you to get out, to separate yourself from these things to the point where you can be curious about them. You want to understand them, because it's through understanding them that you work your way to freedom. So even though it's the end of the day, there are lots of prospects that open up.